what you learned on this episode today, you're not going to hear from your typical gynecologist. Hi, I'm Jane Hogan, the wellness engineer and your host of the Wellness by Design podcast. And my guest today is Dr. Tabitha Barber. Dr. Tabitha is a classically trained gynecologist. She became a gynecologist because she had a deep passion from her own personal experience to be an advocate for women's health. And she left gynecology and her job as chief of staff for the same reason, because she found she was not helping women get better. So now she has an online practice and she is the gutsy gynecologist. And she has a book out called Fasting to Faith. In this episode today, we talk about uh, why she switched her practice, the benefits of fasting, and actually how to get started on a fasting protocol for women, especially for menopausal women, to relieve those symptoms of menopause like hormone fluctuations and inability to sleep, forgetfulness, weight gain, poor gut health, pain, all of these things. And stay tuned till the end because you're going to learn about a really surprising thing that Dr. Tabitha recommends to help you stick with the plan. I hope you enjoy this episode. And don't forget to uh, rate, review, share it with other people. That's how we get the message out and we can make the world a better place. Enjoy. Well, hello. I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Tabitha Ferber to Wellness by Design today. And we're talking about using fasting as a path to pain relief. So welcome, Dr. Tabitha, to Wellness by Design today. Thank you so much. This is such an important conversation. I'm really excited to be here. Me too. Well, I just love the work that you do, and you've just got such a big heart and uh, and want to help so many people. So I'm just very thankful to have you here today. And I'd love to hear, I was quite surprised reading your bio, uh, but I was quite surprised that you, it, we kind of think of medical doctors as having, you know, always been, had a perfect life and so on, but you've had a lot of challenges, right? So what Let's talk a little bit about your background and what led you to become the functional gynecologist that you are today. Yes, I did not have a typical path to becoming a physician. I was a wild child. I thought I was going to be a rock star when I grew up or marry one. Like that was my goal. I was not interested in school. I had C's and D's and sometimes F's. Um, but I got pregnant in 11th grade and I had a very uh, rough pregnancy. I had to go on Medicaid and food stamps, and I was treated like a second class citizen. I was um, really made to feel like insignificant, and a lot of things were done to me procedures, shots, all kinds of stuff. No conversations were had. There was absolutely no informed consent. I really didn't know what was happening to my body, but I trusted the white coats, right? Like you just trust them, they know best. And I had a very traumatic delivery. And out of that delivery, um, I realized that I needed to start using my voice. And of, of course, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Like I can look back now and see everything that happened. But right after my delivery, I de developed Hashimoto's thyroid storm. And I had this horrible hyperthyroid um, situation. And they sent me to the hospital and they gave me radioactive iodine treatment and burned my thyroid out. And I had no idea what I was signing up for. And looking back now, it, you know, I wasn't using my voice and my thyroid was affected, my voice chakra. And so I learned a lot. And that, you know, between my delivery and the Hashimoto's burning my thyroid out, um, I've had lifelong issues that I have to deal with. And so God spoke to me during that time and said, you need to help women have a voice and give them another choice and show them that they need to be their own health advocate. And honestly, I didn't know what that meant or what that looked like, but I figured I better obey. So I went back and got my GED. I 
went to pre-nursing school and got all A's in a community college. And I had a doctor who believed in me and told me I could be a doctor. And so the rest is history. But I'll tell you, like, I spent 15 years becoming a doctor and doing everything I thought I was supposed to do to help women. And here I was practicing and I was absolutely miserable. I was, you know, stuck in survival mode and I was so sleep deprived. I couldn't remember my patients' names that I delivered the night before. And I had such chronic back pain that I couldn't walk away from the OR table after finishing a surgery. So I thought I had sacrificed and done everything I was supposed to do, when in reality, that isn't at all what I was supposed to be doing. I wasn't actually helping women. I wasn't helping myself. And I reached my breaking point and I took four months off of work after a failed back surgery. And I found this whole world of health and wellness that I knew nothing about. (laughs) And once your eyes are opened, you can't go back. Like I realized I was just handing out birth control pills and doing surgery because those are the tools that I was taught as a doctor, but I wasn't actually helping women or healing them. I was just giving this Band-Aid medicine. And so I realized I needed to ask them about their diet and how they move their body and how they process their day and manage their relationships and all the stuff. And you can't do that in 15-minute appointments, right? So um, I did the unthinkable and I left. I left my amazing salary job. Mind you, I came from working class poor people. To me, like they thought I was rich with my paycheck. I gave that up. I gave up my 401k, my position as chief of staff, because I knew it wasn't right and I needed to do something different. And so I created this virtual medical practice and I do functional medicine for women and it not only healed me, but now I actually heal patients. So it's been an incredible journey and I just want women to realize like no matter how stuck you think you are, there's always another way and there's probably a better way. I don't believe we were created to just suffer and get through like the way I was living was not sustainable and it wasn't necessary. It was very much self-induced because I was told like, this is just how it is. You have to give your all. You have to put everyone else first. You can't think about yourself. So I neglected my body and my mind and my soul for a long, long time to serve others, right? Because that's what I was thought was the right thing to do. But you That's not how God wants us to live. Like, it's really not. It's an ego-based way to live because I was thinking, I'm the only one who can do it. I'm the only one who can help these women. I have to, like, give of myself because no one else can possibly do it. And when I realized that's not how I can best serve women, like, everything shifted. My goodness. Thank you. Thank you for the shift and um, for really um listening to that calling of your soul that you you knew what you were doing was not well first of all you listened to the calling of your soul and did what you thought would be the right thing and then listened again when you realized you weren't there doing what you wanted to do and shifted everything and um you know just thank you for that and thank you for teaching people that there's another way so, you, so now you're the functional gynecologist, and you so you see um, patients online. And um, how is being a functional gynecologist different than the work that you did before? So I I know you kind of got yeah. to some of it, but <clears throat> let's just dive into that a little bit. I think it's really important for women to realize that gynecologists are surgeons, OBGYNs are trained surgeons. We do a four-year surgical residency. So all of our training is focused on learning how to do a hysterectomy four different ways, prolapse surgeries, vaginal deliveries, C-sections, procedures in the office, all these surgical-based things. 
We're not hormone experts. We don't study the intricacies of the endocrine system and hormone balance and how the gut affects your hormones and your adrenals and your thyroid and all of these things. And so we look to these so-called women's health experts. That's what they're called. But really, the tools in their toolbox are surgery or birth control pills. And we now realize that birth control pills don't actually regulate your hormones. They completely shut down your entire production of your own hormones. They shut down the communication between your brain and your ovaries. And so you stop producing your sex hormones. And that's really a big deal. We don't think it is, but it's a a very big deal. And it has a long-term impact on women's health, especially because we're on these for sometimes 10, 20, 30 years. And then we go into menopause. And so we have had these hormonal dysfunctions for decades. And then we get the sequelae or the result of being on these synthetic hormones. And it's chronic gut issues and vitamin and mineral deficiencies and an increased risk of osteoporosis and dementia and all of these things and breast cancer. And but nobody talks about that because that is the tool that OBGYNs have to fix your period, to correct your period, to help your acne, to help your headaches. And unfortunately, it doesn't usually work. Where, like, I always would find myself swapping out a different birth control pill. That one didn't work. Let's try this one. Let's try the three month one. Let's, you know, the continuous one. And so we treat women like guinea pigs and we really, don't have hardcore data on like how we should be treating them. And the truth of it is like, we need to go back to the foundational functional basics. How is your gut health? How is your diet? Are you moving your body every day? Are you processing your emotions properly? Are you resting? You know, are you living in a constant fight or flight stress mode? So we're not doing any of that stuff. But I tell women, like, don't even be mad at your OBGYN. They don't know that's not what they're trained in. They're not trained in health and wellness. They're trained to find disease and to remove disease or to deliver a baby, something like that. And so when we look at those doctors and we want them to help us through our menopausal transitions and all of these things, like, they just don't have the tools, right? So... Best interest, but not. Yeah. And it's really sad because we haven't made any progress. Like I've been a doctor for a while now. And when I think back to my training and I think to how doctors are practicing now, it's it hasn't improved. It hasn't changed. Women go in through this menopausal transition and they start feeling depressed. They start feeling anxious. They start having joint pain and muscle aches. And they start waking up in the middle of the night and they start gaining weight. And they either get gaslighted like it's all in your head. You don't know what you're talking about. Your labs look normal. You're just aging. Or they get completely dismissed. Or they get medications that just make their problems worse. So Unfortunately, it's standard of care now to prescribe an antidepressant for menopausal symptoms. So if you go to your gynecologist and say, I have hot flashes and night sweats and mood swings, the first line of treatment is now an antidepressant like Zoloft or Paxil or Prozac. And unfortunately, you're already gaining weight with menopause, which we can talk about, but antidepressants make you gain another five to 10 pounds. So it's just going to make that problem worse. It doesn't actually help your depression because the depression is from your loss of sex hormones and it wipes out your libido, which is already on its way down. So, so many women have like struggling relationships that just get completely destroyed in menopause. Like there was a recent study that came out saying the divorce rate just skyrockets when women go into menopause and they struggle with their jobs because they don't have mental clarity and they're in pain. They give up exercising. Like they give up all the stuff that they loved in life. And we as doctors don't help them. So 
as a functional gynecologist, I try to help them see like, you don't have to go down like that. It doesn't have to end like that. You shouldn't be in pain. You shouldn't be fatigued and low energy and depressed and and gaining weight and all of those things, but we got to treat the root cause of what's going on and really take care of it from there as opposed to this Band-Aid medicine. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that's the whole foundation, really, of functional medicine, isn't it? Coming back to dealing with the root causes. So um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, well, you talked about some menopausal symptoms. I know a lot of my audience is women who are experiencing menopausal, postmenopausal symptoms, and uh, and the waking, waking up at night, uh, mood swings, dryness, all those things. So let's can we kind of talk about how you would deal with that? I know that that you've um, just written this book, um, Fasting to Faith. So I, I I got a feeling that fasting is going to be part of that. But let's let's hear Dr. Tabitha how you. I know it's. I know you're not. Um, we're trying to give like a little synopsis here, right? Not a. Yeah. So, fasting is actually an incredible superpower that we have. Our bodies were created to go without food on a regular basis. I mean, if you think back to the beginning of civilization, we didn't have grocery stores on every corner. We didn't have DoorDash. We didn't have food all of the time readily available. So this this way of eating all of the time from the moment we wake up to the time we go to bed, that is not how our physiology is created to thrive. It really bogs us down and causes dysfunction and disease when we feed ourselves all the time. Our body wants a break. Our pancreas wants a break from producing insulin constantly. And the only way to do that is to stop putting food in your mouth. It doesn't matter if it's healthy. It doesn't matter if it's almonds and those kinds of things. You're still causing a blood sugar spike. You're still requiring insulin to be produced and send it out to the bloodstream to grab that sugar. And if you aren't like running a marathon or doing something physically active, exerting and using that energy that you just put in your body in the form of food, your body has to store it somewhere. And so fatty liver is now becoming the number one reason for liver transplants in this country. It used to be from alcoholism, from too much alcohol will destroy your liver, cause cirrhosis and require transplant. It's now fatty liver from too much food, too much eating, especially of carbohydrates, because carbohydrates, even in the form of, you know, vegetables and grains and things, carbohydrates are still sugar. They're just a bunch of sugars connected. And when you digest them and break them down, they turn into sugar in your body. And like I said, if you don't use that sugar immediately, it gets stored as fat. And the first place it gets stored is in your liver because your body's thinking, okay, we're going to use it soon. Let's put it in our liver. Maybe she'll burn it up soon. But we don't. We just eat again and we store more and we store more. And so now I'm seeing a lot of women with fatty liver and gallbladder dysfunction. And that has a huge impact on your hormones and your gut and everything. So fatty liver is a big deal. If you've been told you have elevated liver enzymes and we're just going to watch them, we'll recheck them next year, see what's happening, or maybe it's from all the Tylenol you take or the Benadryl or the sleeping meds, it's probably not. It's probably because you should no longer be eating the way you did in your 20s and 30s and even 40s. Like We can't eat the same way because we're not physically as active a lot of times, you know? The majority of us women, we might go to Pilates for an hour a couple times a week, but we're not active like a a 15 or 20 year old is. Like, let's be real. So we just don't need that many carbohydrates. And so fasting is a really amazing way to tap in and start burning those sugars off, burning that fat for fuel. And here's the deal. I hear this all the time. Women are like, well, I tried that. It didn't feel good. I got hangry. I was jittery or whatever, right? 
but it's because your body has been in sugar burning mode for so long it forgot how to even get into fat burning mode and burn ketones for fuel so you've lost this metabolic flexibility your body is stuck in sugar burning mode that's why you want more food two hours after you eat you have those cravings you keep you know wanting more it's like you're topping it off all of the time and people think well if i fast the, the cravings will get worse they'll be more intense and it's actually the opposite the cravings go away and so I started running this group fasting program online maybe four or five years ago, I think five years ago. And women would have amazing results. They would lose weight. They would feel so good. They would start to reverse their insulin resistance and their diabetes. That was really amazing to see. Um, but after the program, they would always go back to their ways of eating the standard American diet and, and back to their high carbohydrate hydrate diet and all the things. And so I would inevitably fr be frustrated, right? They would come back to the program six months later and do it again and feel amazing and then go back. So about a year and a half ago, I had this download essentially from God. He said, you need to nourish their soul. You like help them fast, but feed their faith. And so when I added the faith piece in, and I really helped women love their bodies again and love themselves and reconnect with their creator and find their strength from God, it everything shifted. They, they had a reason to continue fasting as a lifestyle. They had a reason to treat their body better and not go back to eating garbage and junk food because they realized like, your body's a gift and it should be honored and treated so well. And once you start doing that, the chronic pain goes away. The The symptoms all kind of dissipate because you're in tune with your body. You know what it needs. When it cries out for help, you know, like, I need to remove this or do this or add this. And you just start to get into this loving relationship and understand your body and treat it the way it needs to be treated as opposed to fighting against your body. Like that's what I did for two decades. I hated my body, you know? And as soon as I could teach women that, like bringing the healing components of fasting with the nourishing faith piece, like that's been the game changer. I can totally understand that because um, until we love ourselves and really appreciate this gift that we've been given, this life experience in this body, um, it, the motivation is not there to continue, right? To really um, stay the course. And so we'll flip back to old habits and so on. So, um, so I think that's really powerful and also really powerful what you said about um, not like it doesn't matter even if you're eating great food, you're eating a lot of food, it's still a problem. So how do you start people on a fasting? Like where, where do you begin? Do you start yeah. like an intermittent type of fasting or where, where, where do you? So this is where people start. Yeah, this is a great question. Like I said, women get frustrated because they feel like they're no good at fasting or fasting doesn't work for them. And it's just not true. Like everybody is created to fast. It's just reminding it how to go from sugar burner to fat burner, regaining that metabolic flexibility. So my program is a progressive fast. It's teaching your body how to get back into fat burning mode. So I actually incorporate a lot of different components um, used in the fasting world. So what we do is we start to eat a more ketogenic diet the first week to remind your body how to burn fat for fuel. So you're eating fat and you're using it for fuel. And then we get rid of the snacks because if you eat enough healthy fats and protein, you won't feel the need to eat snacks. It's because you're satiated longer. Do you have more energy per calorie? With carbohydrates, you have less energy per calorie than you do with fats and proteins, so you're hungry quicker. And so 
it's really important what you're eating. And then you break up with the snacks and then you shrink your eating mm -hmm. window and you realize, hey, I can go 14 hours without food and, or 16 hours. And that is when the magic starts to happen with the healing because your body turns on a process called autophagy where it goes and it gets rid of all the broken cells and DNA and it starts to repair and heal things. But that doesn't kick in until you've done these longer fasts. And so then we do a dinner to dinner fast. And, you know, I have, I had a woman who was in her seventies just last go around and she had uncontrolled diabetes. Her hemoglobin A1C, it was heat something. It was really high. It's supposed to be like five, 5.2, somewhere in there. And it was above eight. She really didn't think she could do this, but she did the dinner to dinner and she felt really good. And mind you, this is a woman who could only leave her hour, her house for two hours max a day. Like that's all her body could handle. And she was too in too much pain and too tired and had to be done after about two hours max. So she did this dinner to dinner fast and she went out for like four hours that next day. And she was so excited. She was like, there's something here. I'm going to trust this process. She didn't know uh, the next week we were doing a three day water fast. And um, because we were using scripture and we were like really filling her faith and giving her hope, she was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do the three day fast because we also have um, a low calorie mimicking fast that you can do if you don't want to do full on water. And she did it and she felt incredible. And she actually um, went on a road trip because her son was gra graduating from Harvard and she went to his graduation. She wasn't going to go. But she felt that good after the three day water fast and had so much healing going on. And her hemoglobin A1C was down in the sixes by the time the program was over. So it was like, you know, she had checked it three months later. And I was so excited by that woman because I knew it works amazing. And your typical menopausal woman with a little insulin resistance, but she was my first uncontrolled diabetic on medications, like almost had given up hope. Like she was she had very little hope left for all of her pain and all of her fatigue. And to see her completely turn it around just with fasting and faith, it it was so so moving to me. And since then, um, yeah, I've had other diabetics in the program just cleaning up the diet, doing this progression where you're eating more fats and proteins, you're breaking up with snacks, you're shortening your eating window, you're doing a longer fast for autophagy, and then you're going into a maintenance lifestyle of fasting. Like, this is just my way of life. Um, that is has been the most successful that I've ever seen for women. So, well, you know, I can speak from my own experience, too, that I found fasting to be um, the quickest way to drop inflammation. And and now it's just, I, I mean, I was one, I, I, before I got RA, I was the kind of person that would get shaky. I'd eat breakfast and I'd be shaky before lunchtime. And my dad, I'm like, he used to not have breakfast. He wouldn't eat till the supper time. And I was like, you're missing the most important meal of the day. This is why I used to, and, and, and he would never get shaky. I said, I don't know how you do that. I get shaky. Well, now I understand my blood sugar was all totally messed up. And so I could not never have imagined going 24 hours or 48. I mean, I just did a three day fast a little while ago and it's not even hard anymore. Right. And the cravings go away, right? What's that? The cravings go away. Yeah, the cravings go away. The only thing I found challenging was what if I smelled food, my because I wanted to um, I wanted to start back with bone some bone broth, and my husband made the bone broth, and I could smell it. And I was like, oh, this is on the like the end of the second day. I was like, I'm really, <laughs> but, but other than that, you know, it's just it's really easy, and 
when once you teach your body, as you said, and so for for me, it's like it is a lifestyle. I you know do intermittent fasting every day, and then I do a longer twenty four hour fast is easy to do that. Uh, do you ha- do you recommend a cycle like a particular cycle for menopausal women for fasting? So, what I found has worked best is you know. I love seeing them go through my 40-day program so they get the progression of teaching themselves how to be metabolically flexible. Again, doing a three-day water fast because it is so healing and reparative, and then going into a maintenance where you're doing low carb and probably a 16-8 window most days, and then every week or every other week doing a dinner-to-dinner fast. And here's the key. You have to have a feast day after it to remind your body that you're not actually starving, that there is enough because your thyroid will downregulate. It will respond. If This is what we have learned is if you chronically don't eat enough calories, if you're in the deprivation of like, I'm just going to eat 1500 calories every day long term, your thyroid will respond and go, she's starving us to death. We're going to have to divert resources. We're going to have to turn down her metabolism and not make as much thyroid hormone. And you will rebound. You will gain that weight back and you will be stuck and miserable. So chronic deprivation, chronic low calorie is not beneficial. And women do best when they have a fast day and then they have a feast day. And for me, a feast day means you have some carbohydrates to replenish yourself that one day. You eat the sweet potatoes, you eat the quinoa, you eat the Brussels sprouts, you do all that stuff. Um, And that seems to give women the best balance because you shouldn't feel deprived. You shouldn't feel, you know, frustrated. It's about healing your relationship with food and realizing that God gave us food to nourish us and to help us. And In this day and age, most people feel worse when they eat. That's a clue. If you eat and you have more pain and more fatigue, you have to fix your your relationship with food. You're eating the wrong food. You're eating it too much, too often. Something's going on. For me, I had to give up gluten and sugar. Like They were destroying me. I would eat a bowl of cereal, and within a half an hour, I would be on the couch so depressed with so much back pain that it would take me out for the rest of the day, sometimes two days, you know? And it took me a lot of trial and error to finally admit that to myself. But once I gave that up, like, I didn't have to get back injections anymore. And I promise you, like, I did months and months and months of back injections. I had a nerve ablation. I've had surgery. Like I thought the medical system could fix me with their procedures. And it was all my diet. It was all my gut. It was all my stress, all of that. And now I live not completely pain-free, but way better than I was. I don't take ibuprofen and Tylenol and miss anything anymore. It's incredible, the shift that has happened. Beautiful, beautiful. And so there's great, um, great results from living a fasting lifestyle. I like that you said, um, we kind of cycle, right? Every week, every week or every couple of weeks doing uh, a dinner to dinner, 24 hour fast, and then following it by a feast day to keep the body guessing, right? We don't because we yes. wanted to think it's starving all the time. All right, this is really beautiful. You've written about this in your book, uh, Fasting to Faith, which is available, I guess, wherever books are sold. Is that right? And we'll have a link. Yeah, that would be awesome. And in the book, I talk about how all the systems are connected. Like if you have a thyroid problem or an adrenal issue or gut problems, immune system problems. You know, a lot of us have autoimmune conditions. And I explain why is your immune system doing what it's doing? Why is it reacting that way? And so I constantly hear feedback from women that are like, oh my gosh, I finally understand my body now after reading your book. Like, thank you. I now know why this happened to me and why it's acting this way. And it's just... I. 
I really want women to be empowered. Like the more you understand what's happening in your body, the more you can advocate for yourself and really know what, how to discern what medications to take or what procedures to have. And hopefully you don't need any of it, you know? So that's my hope for women is like, if you're looking for answers, they're in the book. And the book tells you like, here's the healthy foods that you were actually created to eat. Here's the foods that are destroying you and causing pain and causing dysfunction. And I just make it so simple. And we have amazing recipes inside of our membership and like so many resources. Like there's no reason you should struggle anymore. Mm, Beautiful. I love Dr. Tabitha how your big message is about empowering women. And that's what this podcast is about. Yes. (laughs) What I do is about empowering people as well. So um, I guess just to cover the men in the audience too, does the same type of fasting apply to them? Is it how and for them as well? It is. So even though, you know, God told me to write to women and speak to women, they bring their husbands in and they do the program with them and they have amazing results. Men usually have even better results because they don't have hormonal shifts and a lot of things that we have. They don't have as much autoimmune disease as women have. They don't, their immune system responds differently. So men are so easy to shift. It's crazy. You take away their beer and they drop 30 pounds. Like, yes. So have your husbands do this with you. And I talk a lot about this in the book. It's really important to try to heal in community. We were created to be in community and with each other and to lift each other up. And you shouldn't be struggling alone and you shouldn't be trying to heal alone because that's not how we were created to be. And when you can like cheer other people on and they can celebrate your wins and support you, like that is so um, transformational. Like I see so much better results when women do it with other women. So You know, that's why I have a sisterhood. I just find it to be so much more powerful when we share our stories and we realize that we're not struggling alone. We can learn so much from each other, you know? So true. I love that. So uh, coming back to the empowering theme, I I always ask my guests uh, this question, what's one thing like the baby step someone could do today that's going to begin to initiate that healing transformation? What would you say, Dr. Tabitha? Oh my goodness. So um, I talk about this, like chapter eight in the book is future gazing with God. If you sit down and think, write down like everything that you are frustrated with yourself right now, and then try to see yourself through your creator's eyes. How does he see you? What do you think is your, you know, all the gifts that you have and try to get there. If you can visualize a future self, like not in pain, not tired. How does that woman look? Like, what does she look like? What does she do during the day? What does she eat? Who does she interact with? And then if you get clarity on that woman you want to become, you can start saying, what does she do during the day? And you can start to incorporate and live into that woman you want to become. So you have to see yourself in the future and then work backwards. That was what did it for me. I realized one day I said, I want to drink coffee when I see my patients. I want to do this. And I got super clear. And a couple of years later, I was sitting in my office at home, seeing my patients online, drinking my coffee, walking my dogs, going to work out and doing all the things that I had future gazed. And that was so powerful. And every woman can do that. That's free. You just need to sit down and do it. If you want more guidance, it's in the book. But like, just get clarity on what you do want for your life, you know? So powerful. I love that. I feel like that's the first step for everyone really is to get that vision of of what they want. Thank you so much for all of this, Dr. Tabitha, and the work that you're doing. And where can people find you? We'll have all the links, but just for the people that are listening, where's the best place for people to find you? 
Yeah, drtabatha.com, D-R-T-A-B-A-T-H-A. No I's, just A's. That's the best place because everything leads from there. You know, if you feel like you need to work one-on-one, we have a virtual medical practice. Or if you just want some guidance on fasting, um, you want some spiritual support, like we got all of it for you. (laughs) Okay, we'll have those links there. And I just want to say again, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and being a guest on Wellness by Design today and really sharing with people the power that they have to really change the trajectory of their health. So thanks so much, Dr. Tabitha. Oh, thank you for doing this for women. You're such a gift. Oh, so sweet. Thanks to all the people that are watching or listening. Don't forget to share this with someone else who needs to hear it. You could be changing their life. All right, we'll see you next time on Mom's Side.